Well, good morning. It's good to see you here today as we gather to worship the Lord. Uh, a few announcements before we begin. Uh, Bible study Wednesday at 1.30. Uh, back in the Fellowship Hall going through 1 Peter. And then when we're done with 1 Peter, we're going to move on to 2 Peter. And then take a break for the holiday time. And then in the new year, start another study. Um, we are having trunk and treat this year under safe uh, measures. So if you'd like to be a part of that, there's a sign-up sheet out on the bulletin board that you can sign up. We have some new friends that have signed up, as well as some people who have done it for many years. So uh, let's bless the children in our community by participating in that if we can. Also, the uh, Christmas Child Operation shoe boxes are due the first Sunday of November, which is November 1st. I know I've received many back uh, today. Uh, but you still have some time if you'd like to participate in that. There are some shoe boxes out on the um, uh, credenza uh, in the foyer, uh, the hallway. Um, you can take as many as you want. And uh, something else that's happening, I, I got to tell you this story. Uh, there's a, a person that I know that owns several TV stations. Uh, he's been a part of the Free Methodist Church for many, many years. His name is Larry Roberts. Uh, he also, for a period of, well, actually a long period of time, was the chief operating officer for the Free Methodist Church USA back at our headquarters in Indiana, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. And he's retired now and, and uh, suffering by living in Clearwater, Florida, but he still has these couple TV stations. Uh, he owns KMTR in Eugene, and he owns the CW. I think he owns a few other stations as well. And we have gotten together because we want to bring hope to people during the Christmas Advent season. And so uh, he has developed a, um, a campaign, so to speak, to encourage people. And one of the things that uh, we're going to do is, for those that like to, we're going to have signs to put in your yard at Christmas time to remind people about what Christmas is all about. And uh, Friday, I had another meeting with Larry, and I went to Eugene, and this is an example of a sign. There's a metal part to it. There's also a different color, if you prefer the other side. But the message is the same, peace and joy, a gift from Jesus. Um, and so we're going to have a sign-up sheet out on the bulletin board next Sunday. Uh, I have ordered, pre-ordered 75 signs. Um, if you'd like a sign to put up in your yard, please sign up on that sign-up sheet. They are ten dollars. Uh, he is. Um, how do I explain this? There's no money being made by anybody on this. Uh, in fact, what he doesn't get back in terms of donations, he's covering for himself, and he's committed to thousands and thousands of dollars to, to see that this goes on. So if you'd like a sign, they are $10. You can just put it in the offering, an extra $10 in the offering plate. We're not going to keep track who paid or what. That's just too much work for us at this time. But if you'd like to participate, uh, sign your name, and then I'll make sure that you get a sign. The other awesome thing about this, this campaign of hope is that we are going to be listed on, there's going to be a, a commercial with this theme, that's going to be ran over 450 times during the mid-November to Christmas time. And Kalapuya will be listed in that commercial for free. That's a pretty good thing, isn't it? And so we're going to get uh, the, the message out and, 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 and about us here in Sutherland. There's not a whole lot of churches that are part of this. So this is an exciting way to, to get a positive message out and I'm excited about it. And so next, uh, in a couple of weeks, he's coming through and he's going to drop off the signs here and then go on to Eugene, uh, mainly a few churches in Eugene. And we here in Sutherland are participating in this uh, wonderful outreach. And just to have the fact that here's a guy that owns a couple TV stations is willing to give us free airtime. I think that's exciting. So if you'd like to be a part of that, sign up next Sunday on the sign up sheets. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalms 113, verses 1 through verse 3. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, may the name of the Lord be praised. That's what we're here today. 
to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have through either being here in the sanctuary or being in our homes and participating through Facebook or YouTube. We want to thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your love, for your compassion. And Father, we pray that through all that we say, think, and feel today, Lord, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, and that through our lives, Lord, we may draw people to you and not away from you. So Lord, help us to do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's participate in these songs of worship this morning that Sylvia will play for us. Let's think about these words and let's make them our personal praise to God this morning.
Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're thankful that where you say there's one or two or three gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. And through the power of your spirit, you are present with us and how thankful we are for that. We want to thank you for another day that we can be together in worshiping you, whether it be here in the sanctuary or in our homes through Facebook or YouTube. We want to thank you for your compassion, for your love, for the grace that you have extended to us through Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that we would be thankful for that gift. We're thankful for the gift of salvation through Jesus. We're thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers us and guides us and comforts us and at times, yes, convicts us. And we're thankful for your church that seeks to make Christ known to all and seeks to love people like Christ loved people. So Lord, help us to reach out to people here for, for Jesus here in Douglas County and beyond and see your church grow and flourish even in these challenging times that we're living in. We do, Heavenly Father, we ask for wisdom and strength and protection for those who serve to protect us and defend our freedom. And we ask today, Father, that you would bless brothers Kyle and Blair Robertson who serve in the Air Force, that you bless brothers John and Josiah Mann who also serve in the Army, and bless Christopher Black, as he serves as a chaplain in the Air Force, and Tyler Vitti, who serves as a test pilot in the U.S. Navy. Father, how thankful we are for all who have served and who are serving, and we ask a special blessing upon them today. Lord, we also ask that you'd help those that we know and those unknown to us who have lost jobs due to this pandemic. We pray for those who are recovering from the coronavirus and we pray for family and friends who have lost a loved one, a friend, a co-worker. We pray for a safe vaccine that will be available to all people. And Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for those in our church family for our healing, and we pray today again for Karen Baird. Father, we're thankful to see Vicki Hokuson with us today and ask that you continue to bless and strengthen her. We pray for Julia Kilgian, for Tom Outland, and for Helen Schrader. Lord, give them peace and strength and healing in their lives. And we pray for the family of Judy Toth, who passed away, that you would give her son and daughter comfort in this difficult time in their lives. And again, Father, we thank you. We're thankful for you saving our souls. We're thankful, Lord, that you make us whole. And we understand that this came at a great cost the cost of your son Jesus going to the cross for us and shedding his blood so that we could be forgiven, so that we could experience abundant life as well as that life which is yet to come. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are continuing in our journey in the Gospel of Matthew that we started in January, and we are in chapter 9 today. But one of the things that we have really seen um, take place in Jesus' ministry is not only does he teach about the kingdom of heaven and that we are to live those values, those truth in our lives now, but we see that Jesus moves beyond teaching to living out those principles of the kingdom of heaven as he encourages others, as he comforts others, as he brings healing in the lives of other people. And at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, if you remember, after he had finished uh, being in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights after his baptism, uh, Jesus begins his public ministry. And in chapter 4, verse 23, and I'm going to read this. It's not on the uh, screen today, but this really 
in a nutshell, as a verse, tells us about the ministry that Jesus will have as we continue throughout the Gospel of Matthew. And it says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering from severe pains, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and they're paralyzed and healed them. We see Jesus doing this not only in the Gospel of Matthew, but also in the other Gospels, Mark, Luke, and John. And we even see this ministry of healing being carried out in the early church, especially as we read the book of Acts, the history book of the early beginnings of the church. But today again, we're going to see Jesus touching the lives of those who are hurting, who have faith in him, who believe that Jesus can do something for them that he that. They need done. And so we'll begin reading in verse 18 in chapter 9. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went went with him and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, will I be healed? I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue's leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away, the girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread throughout all that region. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him all over that region. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. So in this encounter, in our journey in the Gospel of Matthew today, we see people coming to Jesus with faith. And faith is simply trust. These people are coming to Jesus because they trust that he can do something for them that they can't do for themselves. Let's face it, when we are sick, who do we normally go to visit? We go to see our doctor, don't we? And we have a certain level of trust in them, don't we? We trust that because of their knowledge and their experience that they can help us out with our aches and our pains and the challenges that we face in life. And most of the time, they come through, if we're honest. Sometimes they, we may feel that they really don't understand us or they're not listening to us. But most of the time, if, if, if we put our trust in them and their knowledge and their expertise, they, they do come through and they do help us to get better as much as they can humanly possibly do. So these people come to Jesus with this simple trust in him because they have heard already Jesus doing some incredible things, healing the man with leprosy, healing the centurion's son, 
healing Peter's mother-in-law, healing other people that were brought to Jesus. They, the, the news of what Jesus is doing is spreading like a wildfire. And that is good news. And it's good news, especially for people who are hurting and suffering and need a miracle in their life. And so here we have these four different stories this morning of Jesus' compassion to those who have faith in him, to those who trust in him. Now, the first story is of a father who has experienced great loss in his life. His daughter has died. And we read from other gospels, for example, Mark chapter 5 and I think Luke chapter 8, that this synagogue ruler has a name and his name is Jairus. And as a synagogue ruler, he was responsible for the local synagogue. He was kind of like an elder. And he would choose the person that would speak that, that Sabbath. He would choose the scripture that would be read that Sabbath. He would make sure the doors are locked in the synagogue and everything was kept in its right place. He was a person in that community that had a very important position. And yet tragedy hit his family. His daughter, a young daughter, died. Now there is no greater pain in a person's life than when they lose a child. Would you agree? That is a loss that you experience for the rest of your life. My grandmother and grandfather had uh, two daughters, my mother and then my aunt, and, the, and they had a son, and his name was Arthur. And, uh, uh, and they loved their son, and uh, he, after graduating from Crow High School, went and joined the Air Force. And, and really uh, raised up in the ranks. But he, when he was home, he was stationed for many years in, in Turkey with the NATO forces. But he came home on leave, and he was traveling from Fort Lewis, Washington, down to Eugene to visit his mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. And sadly, on his journey, he was hit and killed by a drunk driver. That was a tragic time in my grandparents' life. I don't remember too much of that. I, I remember my Uncle Art twice, once in a fishing boat when I was scared to death, and one other time. But I remember uh, uh, coming back to the house, because our parents put us in daycare instead of taking us to the service. But I remember going back to Grandma and Grandpa's house, and here were all these military men with their uniforms and their medals and all this stuff. And I'm just like, oh, what's going on here? But when I went to live with my grandmother when I went to college for four years, I knew there were times when she was missing her son. That pain was still there. In fact, she would call me sometimes, Art, and my eyes would just go, boing, uh, Grandma, I'm Stuart, and she, then she realized what she had done. But as I share with friends who have experienced that kind of loss, you know, grief is the price we pay for those that we love. But in this story, here's a father who's experienced loss in his life. He's heard about this Jesus, and he goes to Jesus. And this man takes great risks in doing so because of his position in the community. He knows the Pharisees and the Sadducees do not like what Jesus is teaching or what Jesus is doing. He knows that by going to Jesus and asking Jesus for help, he places his job at risk. He places his standing in the community at risk. He is willing to take a risk for the love of his daughter. And so he comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, if you would just come and touch her, she will live again. And Jesus is willing to do that. Jesus has compassion on this man and his situation that he's enduring, that he's facing, that he's experiencing. Well, as they're making their journey, it's kind of like we have a little interruption of the story because there's another person that is in need of a miracle in their life, and it's a story about this woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. She has a bleeding issue. And again, a lot of us in our culture, we don't understand that. We, don't, we think, well, what big deal is that? I mean, she's still living. But at that time in Jewish culture, for a woman to have that issue, it made her unclean. It meant she could not marry. 
It meant she could not have children. It meant that she was really an outcast in her own community, in her own family, that anybody that touched her would also become ceremonial unclean as well. And so she lived a very lonely, sad life. And, and she wanted to be able to have life again. She wanted to be able to have relationships with others. And she knew that the only way possible for that to happen in her life is if this Jesus that she's heard about would heal her as well. And this woman, too, takes a big risk in doing what she is going to do. She's not to be around the crowd. And again, the context of this story is Jesus is following Jairus to his home. The crowds are getting bigger, and they're following Jesus as well. Here is this woman who takes a big risk, and she just believes simply if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would be made well. I mean, that's faith. If I could just touch his cloak. He doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't have to say be healed. He doesn't have to touch me physically. She also knew that if she touched Jesus, again, according to the Jewish mindset, she would make Jesus unclean. Now, we know that's not the truth with Jesus. Jesus touches unclean people and makes them clean again. He has that power and that ability. And so here she does. She goes amongst the crowd, makes her way to Jesus, and she touches the hem of his garment and Jesus realizes something's happened. He turns to this woman and he says, Oh, daughter, your faith, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. And Matthew records at that very moment when Jesus utters those words, this woman's health issue, this woman's 12-year battle with bleeding, is stopped. She is healed. Again, because of the compassion of Jesus responding towards her faith. Now, as Jesus continues on, the, on his way to Jairus' house, as he encounters the front of the house, there's a lot of noise going on. There's pipes that are being played. There are people who are mourning which was typical in that culture that when a family member or a friend passes away, there is a period of time when people mourn and they well. And, and oftentimes also, those that had money would hire professional mourners who would play their instruments and who would mourn. And Jesus, after he gets them away, because they don't understand what's, what's happened, he goes into the house and he touches Jairus' daughter's hand, and she's restored to life. This is the first time we see Jesus raising somebody from the dead in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus had, has had the power over uh, uh, those that are sick with leprosy, for example. Jesus has power over the, the elements, the wind. Remember the story of the disciples on the Sea of Galilee? Jesus has authority over the wind. Jesus has authority over the spiritual realm as he frees people from demonic oppression. We see Jesus has the authority to do incredible things, but now we see the ultimate example of his authority is in raising dead people back to life. Well, the story continues. The compassion of Jesus is now for two guys that are blind, Two guys that are blind. As word spreads, people are hearing these things about Jesus. And so here are two blind men who want to be able to see. And apparently, I don't know if they have friends that are helping maneuver them and, and get them closer to Jesus. Matthew doesn't say here. But these two blind men hear that Jesus is near them, is approaching them. And what do they cr do? What, what is it they want? They, they cry out. Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, this is the first time that we see Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew referred to with the title Son of David, which is a very important messianic title. And so they cry out to Jesus, have mercy on us. They're not asking for mercy from judgment. The greatest thing that's on their heart at that moment is to be able to see. 
And so they cry out, Lord, have mercy on us. And Jesus responds to them. Verse 28, do you believe that I am able to do this? So that's why we know what they really wanted. Jesus says, do you believe I am able to do this? And their response was simply, yes. In fact, yes, Lord. And then Jesus touched their eyes. Now, again, Jesus, as we've seen, he can touch people and bring healing. He can speak words of healing. But here we see him, again, touching the eyes of those two blind men. And he simply says, according to your faith, let it be done. And the scripture tells us that their sight was restored, that the blind could see. And who was it that they were looking at right in front of them? It was Jesus. It was Jesus who had compassion on them, who helped them in their deepest need. It was Jesus. Now, it's interesting. We don't know why. Jesus tells them, you know, let's keep this quiet. Maybe Jesus realized he didn't have a lot of time, and if word got out about that, then, you know, people would have treated him like an optometrist and uh, distracted him from what he needed to do. We don't know why Jesus asked them in a very sternly way, let's keep this between ourselves. Now, while they were grateful for being healed, were they very obedient? No, they, they weren't. They went out and they told everybody. They told everybody as it says in verse uh, 31, but they went out and spread the news about him all over the region. Now, a region is a large amount of land, a, a lot of territory. We could say Douglas County is a region here in Oregon. These guys, wherever they went, wherever they walked, they told people about this Jesus who restored their sight, who made them able to see again. I guess you could say they were some of the first evangelists uh, when you look at it, at, at it that way. So we see the compassion of Jesus for the blind. But we also see the compassion of Jesus for somebody that didn't have the faith at that time. And that's the story about this man who is brought to Jesus, who is demon-possessed and could not talk. Now, he was brought to Jesus and so that tells us that there were some people that cared enough for this individual that these friends, whether they were friends or family members, knew that their troubled, possessed friend needed help. And as the news spread around Jesus, about Jesus to all the regions around where they lived, they heard, too, that Jesus could do the miraculous, that Jesus could give people really life, abundant life. And that's why Jesus came, you know. Uh, Jesus said, if you remember uh, in the Gospel of uh, John, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Well, Jesus, wherever he goes, whoever he heals, whoever he restores, he blesses them with abundance of life. So these friends bring their friend who is mad, so to speak, who is possessed by some kind of dark, evil force, who's not able to speak. And here we see Jesus, I think, honoring the faith of those people who brought this man. This man doesn't come to faith, I believe, until afterwards, until after he's freed from this oppression, when he's able to speak again. And so here these friends bring this man to Jesus and Jesus drives out the demon, and then he's able to speak. Quite the miracle. He's freed. He's whole again. That's what Jesus does for people. He frees them, and he makes them whole. And the responses from the crowd, from the people who are following Jesus and watching all that's going on, is that they are amazed in fact, it says the crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. This is the supernatural that is happening before their very eyes. This is teaching people that this Jesus, who is speaking about the kingdom of heaven, 
is bringing heaven on earth in the form of healing and hope and compassion to those who are in need. Now, sadly, the Pharisees and others had a different response to what was going on. They were attributing to what Jesus was doing to the power of the evil one. They missed the whole boat, so to speak, when it comes to understanding who Jesus is because they were so full of themselves. They were so prideful. They were more con uh, concerned about their positions and their power and their authority than the truth before their very eyes. But wherever Jesus went, he made people whole who were willing to trust him, who were willing to take risks like Jairus and like the... Um, the woman with the hemorrhage, the bleeding. Jesus was willing to set people free and heal them. And you know what? I believe the same Jesus of yesterday is the same Jesus for today. In fact, Hebrews teaches us. I remember, I remember this verse because when I was a little boy, the first church I ever went to was a, a, a little four-square church in Redmond, Oregon that our parents sent us to with our neighbors uh, who went there. And on the wall in their sanctuary, on the right-hand side, were the words from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, which says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that good news? And that's why we can trust him. And I know a lot of you have had some very difficult times in your life where you turn to Jesus, and he's the one that has got you through what you had to go through. And he will still be that same one who will get us through what we have to go through. He will get us through this pandemic. Has it been fun? Has it been a great year? It's been challenging, hasn't it? It's hard. It's hard wearing the mask everywhere you go. It's hard not being able to do the events that you normally do with other people. Uh, it's hard not to be able to sing like we have sung in the past, but we're going we're gonna to get there eventually. It's been hard not to be able to travel and see friends. It's hard not to be able to hug your grandchildren or your children. But Jesus is getting us through. Some of our friends have had some pretty big health challenges with cancer. Jesus is seeing them through and has seen them through and will see them through. But we got to keep our focus on Jesus. That's where our ultimate trust should be. People will disappoint you. Has anybody ever disappointed you? Friends will disappoint you. Co-workers will disappoint you. Do I even dare say politicians will disappoint you? <laughs> but Jesus, Jesus will never disappoint you. And that's the person that you and I must put our ultimate trust in. Jesus never fails. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for reminding us through these incredible accounts of how people approach Jesus, some at great risk to trust him. And because of their trust, we see their lives forever changed. And we see the lives of others in a ripple effect changed as well because they realize this Jesus of Nazareth is just not a good Jewish boy. He's just not a good teacher. He's just not a good man. He is more than that. He is the son of David. He is your son here on this earth, the embodiment of who you really are. He is the word that was made flesh, full of grace and truth. And Lord, help us to embrace that truth that changes our lives, that, that gives us hope. And if there's anything that our, 
people that we know and friends that we have and family members that we have know is that they need hope. And that hope is there in the person of Jesus Christ who simply asks for us to trust him. And so, Lord, I pray that we have come to that place in our lives where we trust in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us, that we listen to him and we live a life that reflects who he is to those around us. So, Lord, help us to do that, we pray. For we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, in closing, let's stand as we sing together our closing song that we do sing, the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord look upon you and give you grace. Amen.